What is my life worth? This is the Sunday Fun Day Podcast. Your hangovers never sounded so good. I'm your host, Akil Patterson. As we talk on this wonderful Sunday Fun Day about privilege. What is going on in this world that we call America right now? Privilege. Where a homeless man can set up a tent in the middle of a bus. Everyone else is in the wrong for telling him, please don't. My name is Gil Patterson. This is the Sunday Funday podcast. Your hangovers never sounded so good. What you just uh, heard or saw me watching was a, uh, a, a YouTube on um, or a TikTok video of this gentleman who pitches a, a, a hammock on a bus. And a bus driver is like, hey, man, I'm, I'm not moving this bus in, until you untie that. And he's adamant about, no, you can't see me. I can't see you. Just drive the bus. I want to be in this hammock. And then everybody else is like, hey, man, we don't know what you're doing. But could you please stop? You know, because the rest of us have places to go. Sounds about right. Sounds fair. Sounds reasonable that uh, one person might have an issue that they decide they it's important. Um, does not mean that everyone uh, in that uh, area should be uh, hindered. But, you know, they, they have their choices. And it brings me back to uh, the civil rights movement. And if you're very familiar with the civil rights movement, uh, in uh, throughout, you know, it it's far older than the 60s, but in the civil rights movement in terms of, the, of getting a very fast change in a short period of time, um, which really wasn't a short period of time because, you know, we've been fighting through slavery and Jim Crow, but either way. But you look at a, a short period of time where people had to start identifying that there was a problem and that they needed to fix it. Um, and by the time it reached the halls of Congress, it, it had reached actually a breaking point. And there was this movement in, in the 60s, the civil rights movement, where um, they, would, they would have like peaceful protests. They would do things that were... Uh, illegal acts at the time, but they were actually boycotting or protesting the actual act. So if I, as a black man, were to sit in at a, at a coffee stand, right, you know, diner, you know, just, just sit there at the diner, which used to be pretty popular, um, I couldn't, you know. Um, if I, you know, was on a bus, I had to sit at the back of the bus. Who knows that now that that's all anyone ever wants to do is sit in the back of the bus because it's where all the cool kids sit. But um, you would you you kind of you'd feel kind of slighted, and so you know civil disobedience kind of came into play around those sort of things. Like, hey, this is a this is a this is what we're doing civil disobedience, but we're also doing it because this is something that directly impacts us. And when you see people that are involved in civil disobedience in many times, many many aspects, it's because it does impact them. But when it no longer impacts the individual uh, that seems to always be doing the civil disobedience, does it really help the community that they claim to be helping? Uh, the question is question mark, because privilege comes into play here. There has never been a movement. Never. There has never been a movement that did not take the help of the majority working with the minority. Listen to it once again. There has never been a movement where it did not take the help of the majority to help the minority. So whatever population you think you are, if you say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a minority population, and we'll say minority people with six, six fingers, right? And that's a minority. It does not just looking at strictly a six finger. That's it. If you got six fingers on one hand, something wrong with you, but you're a minority. That minority group was, <laughs> would always have the support of the majority, right? 
Because everybody else with five fingers is going to be like, hey, man, I got you. It's cool. We're friends. Like We're united. Hey, you might have a six finger, but we're good. And because of the majority, the majority then gives validation to the minority, uh, almost as when you're talking about nations or states or governments, the majority, the most populous group, tends to say, okay, we will accept X. And that's that. But when you fail to recognize that every movement took the majority to work with the minority, you start to you start to forget. You start to forget up here what you're really fighting for. You have to be willing to say, is this what they are fighting for? Is this everything they need? That's where we check our privilege. This man who went around in circles, you can't see me, I can't see you. Acting as though he had more rights than everyone else on that that bus. I mean, probably his mentally health issues, but you know what they used to do? They used to be like, get off. But now we got to treat everybody with such compassion. It's like, well, I want to be compassionate, but when when do we stop just being compassionate and we also start being real? Recognizing that we do live in a somewhat civil society where people... You know, the basic decorum, rules of engagement, hand heart of hearts. That, that era that we once lived in, that era where we would say, oh, you know, everyone is going to be accepted here. I don't know if that's going to exist. Because not everything is for everybody. I, I've said it before many times. I don't think I don't think it's any any consequence of of any real measure, but we're not built to like people all the time. We're not built to let this guy just hijack my day and watch him go around in circles while he pretends he's on some sort of trip. I don't even know what he was thinking. I'm in my hammock. I want my hammock. I'm on a bus. People are on the bus. Sir, people can get hurt. Why don't you just get down? Now we're delayed the bus, and now somebody else is late for work. This is where I go back to civil disobedience and movement. So in those movements throughout the 1960s, in the civil disobedience, People committed those acts because they directly were going to be impacted by them, right? So um, you hear about the Montgomery bus boycott, right? Well, they boycotted the bus. So that means they had to walk to work. Or they had to carpool. In some cities, when they decided to do this, uh, a new a new era started of you know jitney drivers. Jitney drivers are a Pittsburgh thing, but... Some people just call them like gypsy drivers or guys without a hack in New York. Guys they don't they don't have a medallion, but you know, they serve a neighborhood. They're driving people all over the place. They're paying them cash. You know, it, it became a real thing in black communities. But it all stemmed from them saying, look, there's a problem. We don't want to give our money to this racist bus system. This bus system. And so the civil rights movement strategically looked at targeting that system. And because of everything that was connected to it, it detrimentally harmed the city. It, they, they were worried. The, the bus was about to go bankrupt. People were going to lose jobs. There were going to be layoffs. And it was all because black people and their fans and friends and supporters stopped using the bus system. It was a direct action that had a direct impact. I got involved with the organization, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, and many of them were born out of something called ACT UP. And if you're not familiar with ACT UP, ACT UP uh, was uh, was around in in the 19 um, oh what 
1980s, sorry, ACT UP came out of the 1980s HIV and AIDS movement where a lot of people, um, a lot of you know women and, and, and friends of, of people who were dealing with HIV or the AIDS virus were, they were dying. And so these people started to do things that were just, just, just annoying. Just absolutely like lay down in the middle of Times Square right at the heart of traffic hour. They were just trying to get the president's attention so he would release a medication called AZT, which would go on to help so many lives. And it also killed people's kidneys and livers. But it was the first step, right? The government shouldn't be hiding medication that could be helping people. They should be, hey, it's your decision to take this. It's experimental, but we don't know what this thing is. We've dealt with epidemics before, people. We dealt with them before. That COVID thing wasn't the first. HIV killed hundreds of thousands of people. Probably in the millions worldwide. Entire villages are wiped out. Most people don't even know that. So when we look at what HIV has done, it's been very deadly. But I, I, I say all that to go back to the original point is that Here's a moment. We're out of pain, the privilege that, that people don't seem to know they have, out of that privilege of, hey, being able to say, I'm going to boycott. I have the money. I have the resources to do this. I can get by. While someone else who doesn't have the resource is doing the exact same thing. It's how unions became strong in America. Unions. When people talk about a union, let me tell you, your grandfathers and your great-grandparents who actually fought for these unions to be out here, they got blood on their hands because it, it was a blood sport and it was messy. It was messy. But they did it because it was important to them. They did it because it meant something. It was connected to them. Civil rights movement, labor movement, LGBT rights movement, they all were similar because they all had people that were directly impacted that were right in your face and you saw who they were. See that? You had to see their faces. You had to know who they were because you have to say their name, even with the trans women that are being murdered at an undisproportionate rate in this country. You got to see them. You got to say their names. You got to know they exist. See, I don't mind the people that are advocates about stuff that stand up for something. Because then you show your face, you tell people who you really are. There is no privilege, none, for those people who experience hunger, homelessness, fatigue, mental health disorder. There's no, there's no reprise. But guess what? You get to see them. And even though you may not agree with somebody, you at least can see them. You can look at them, identify them. All right, I respect it. I ain't going to listen to you. I don't follow you, but I, I respect you. I see you. I see you out there fighting for what you believe in. See, I want the fighters to believe in something. I want fighters to win. I want people to be out there and do their thing. I want you to be successful. I want you to grind, and I want you to grind away. I want you to get everything you feel that you're entitled to, but I want you to do it with love in your heart. See, that's where a lot of people get struck, messed up. Excuse my language. They don't do things with love in their heart. Instead, it's about anger. It's about hate. It's about fear. Why don't we just start doing things because it's the right thing to do? <coughs> <coughs> oh, my goodness. <coughs> oh, that went down the wrong. Honey, child. <coughs> Guys, I don't even know how I do that. I, I really don't. 
But uh, oh man, oh excuse me. Oh, that was a deep rooted cough. But no, privilege. Privilege is being able to hide who you are and not have to talk about it when you go home. Privilege is looking at a man who makes seventeen dollars and fifty cents an hour and thinking that well, he doesn't care about the things I care about. No, he probably just ain't got time. I love humanity. I love it. I just don't trust the devil inside of humanity. You got some southern folks in your family who've heard that before. Oh, I trust man. I just don't trust the devil inside man. Put it any way you want. Say it any way you need to. We all got that thing, that thing in us that that prevents us from being the best version of ourselves. Sometimes it is our privilege. And I know, I know somebody's like, yo, what you know about privilege? I'll be like, yo, I know a lot about privilege. I do. I do. I, I do. See, being a a, a, a big gay, sexy, black man that is mistaken for straight more than he does for gay. I get it. When I walk down the street, people aren't looking at me like I'm, I'm, I'm a quote-unquote sissy or a fairy. I get it. But I also get asked, do I know what kind of club this is? I know what type of privilege it is to be a big man that when I go out at night, I don't have to worry about people thinking about mugging me too often. Although they, they might. Crazy is crazy. But most people aren't thinking about mugging me. But then I also, some of my friends don't have to think about every action and every movement they make that evening. So they don't get killed by the police or hemmed up on something that they didn't want to get hemmed up in. See, I know about my privilege because I got to play Division I football, and I was an administrator of a Division I athletics program. I got the privilege of doing those things, but I also had the displeasure of being mocked, ridiculed, and harassed. There were night. There were many nights where swastikas were thrown on my car, and very not nice languages, <laughs> and notes, and tires, and yeah, just people just generally fucking with me. But I also know that when it came down to it, I had the privilege of being able to eventually get out and have a plan, and move on with my life. A lot of people don't have that privilege. See, I understand privilege because privilege isn't just about being skin tone. It's just not. I've lived in some of the most rural parts of America <laughs> and some of the most populous parts of America. I've seen bad I've seen worse. I've seen what third world countries go through. I've seen what first world problems go through. I think that every time I've had the opportunity to be part of something, I've embraced the change. I've I've kind of settled in to be like, okay, how bad is this? What what's going to be the the that's it moment for me? Rather, it's poverty, rather, it's a sense of belonging, rather, it's homelessness, rather, it's hunger. We all have to experience something. And I think I've said it before, struggle doesn't make things bad. Struggle makes you human. It makes you normal. It makes you a regular frickin' man. 
just when you're struggling to do something or get something done, sometimes you just got to do one thing, and that's just do it. Get up. Walk outside. <laughs> Changing that tire is going to suck. Get a jack. Call a buddy. Do something to make it better. Because if you stay in that same place, that tire will never get fixed. Those brakes will never get changed. That oil will never do itself. Until you do something, everything will stay just as it is. And trust me, I got my own anxieties. I hate, I hate cleaning. I hate it. But I have my you know, friends come over and we clean the house together. Or we'll do some activities or we'll do a game. Like, I have to make things about getting something accomplished because otherwise I just don't feel like I'm doing anything. So that first step of our of recognizing our privilege is just saying, hey, if you can say, yes, I am privileged because I am a white male. Okay, cool. There we go. Got it out the way. So now what do you do after that? There's the question mark. You've relinquished your privilege. Then what? Now what? How do you help somebody with that? How do you give somebody else something? I'm an educated black male. I have gone to some great institutions. How can I help someone else get in? How can I help a friend become a homeowner? Hey, I've got a property that I, I'd like to sell. Hey, you want to buy it? Hey, I'll give you a good rate. Boom, we both win. I've gotten a return on my investment. He's gotten a property. He now is a homeowner. I now, you know... We come together. We make it a win-win. You got to find a way to get, make the deal. Everybody was waiting for the perfect thing. No, no politician is perfect. They're not. Don't let them lie to you. They're all flawed. But don't wait for a politician. Don't wait for your doctor. Don't wait for a lawyer. Don't wait for your cousin. Don't wait for your sister. Don't wait for your brother. Don't wait for your homies. Just do something. Do a little something every day. Just get past that hump. Once you do that, that privilege that you have, you'll learn how to leverage it. You'll learn how to pick up the phone and make a call on behalf of somebody else. And not expect a daggone thing from it. Doing the right thing for the right reason. That's what we do. That's who you are. Don't worry about the privilege that everyone thinks you have. Acknowledge your privilege. Acknowledge it. Whatever it is. If you're tall, acknowledge you're tall. Hey, I, look, guys, there's nothing I can do about being this tall. Man. But God did not give me the basketball handling skills that I needed. But he did make me a pretty dope artist, and now I can reach high things. There. But figure it out. Be excited about being here in this world, on this planet again. Be excited. Be excited about something. We ain't got much time left. Either here on this earth or beyond. So figure it out. Be excited. Take whatever privilege you have and turn it into that asset that you know you can use on the side of good because there is good in you. There's good things ready to happen to you and for you, but you got to be ready for it. You got to be ready. Well, folks, I'm ready too. This has been the Sunday Funday Podcast. Your hangovers never sounded so good catch me every week make sure you like follow and subscribe and remember folks have a great day and a even better tomorrow